If you have any interest in physics, and since you're watching this video, chances are you do. You've probably heard terms like Planck length, Planck time, Planck temperature, and so on. But what are these quantities? Where do they come from? And what do they actually mean? That's what we're gonna delve into today. Units of physical measurements are crucial, not just for physicists, but for everyone. They play a significant role in the life of any modern person. Let's say you want to bake bread. You can easily find a recipe online that tells you to take, for example, 500 grams of flour, 350 milliliters of water, some amount of oil, yeast, sugar, salt, and so on. Mix it, then place it in an oven preheated to, let's say, 250 degrees Celsius for 35 minutes. However, to use this recipe, you need to understand what a gram, milliliter, degree, and minute are. Imagine living 500 years ago. You wouldn't have been able to follow such a recipe simply because you wouldn't have understood the quantities required. The modern system of units that we are accustomed to began to take shape in the 17th century. The concept of the meter was proposed by the English philosopher and linguist John Wilkins as the length of a pendulum with a one-second period. He also suggested the gram as the unit of mass, defined as the mass of water poured into a cube with sides of one centimeter. Using a pendulum to define the meter turned out to be less successful, partly because pendulums of equal length oscillate with slightly different frequencies in different parts of the Earth due to variations in gravity at different latitudes. So the meter was later redefined based on the Earth's meridian length, a more universal approach. However, it wasn't very practical to measure the Earth's circumference every time you needed to make a ruler. Therefore, meter standards were created and kept in specially designated places, and measurements were compared to these standards when needed. Nevertheless, the idea that our entire measurement system was tied to a few pieces of metal seemed somewhat unreliable to many. In the early 20th century, physicists had an idea. What if we create a system of units based on fundamental constants, which are inherent to nature? One such system was proposed by the German physicist Max Planck. He suggested taking three fundamental constants, believed to be the same throughout the universe and constant over time, as the basis for his system. These constants were the speed of light, the gravitational constant from Newton's law of universal gravitation, and the Planck constant, or the quantum of action. The Planck constant was initially introduced as the proportionality coefficient between the energy of photons and the frequency of the corresponding electromagnetic wave. The idea was to create a system in which the value of these constants would be equal to one. Among other things, this would eliminate constants from the formulas, significantly reducing the amount of writing required in physics. For example, in this system, Newton's law of universal gravitation would be expressed not in the familiar form, but as a simple product of masses divided by the square of the distance. However, these would be expressed not in familiar units, but in so-called natural units, or later named after the idea's author, Planck units. So physicists set out to derive units of length, mass, time, velocity, energy, and momentum from these fundamental constants. For example, the Planck mass turned out to be the square root of the product of the Planck constant, the speed of light, and the gravitational constant divided by the gravitational constant. The length was the square root of the Planck constant multiplied by the gravitational constant and divided by the cube of the speed of light, and so on. The resulting system of units turned out to be practically useless from a practical standpoint. For instance, the Planck mass is approximately 2.1 times 10 to the power of minus 8 kilograms, or roughly 2 millionths of a kilogram. Measuring everyday quantities in such units is not very convenient. However, in some areas of physics, such as nuclear physics, quantum mechanics, and relativity theory, it proved convenient to occasionally work with quantities in the natural unit system if only to avoid having to carry around formulas kilometers long that include all these fundamental constants. However, then physicists had the thought, could these quantities themselves have some meaning? Among the various methods used in physics, there is the so-called dimensional analysis, which allows predicting the relationship between system parameters by combining quantities that characterize the system. Let me give you a simple example. 
Imagine we need to calculate the time it takes for an object, dropped from a height h, to fall to the ground under the influence of gravitational acceleration g. Suppose we haven't studied kinematics, where the corresponding formula is derived rigorously, but we know that time, in our case, is measured in seconds, height in meters, and gravitational acceleration in meters per second squared. Therefore, we can assume that the sought relationship will be the square root of h per g, because this combination of meters per second squared and just meters will result in something measured in seconds. In physics, in such cases, it is said that we obtained the formula from dimensional considerations. Dimensional analysis indeed works and allows, in many cases, to derive quite plausible formulas, albeit with some coefficient of proportionality. For example, the exact solution to our problem obtained in kinematics would look like this. In our case, the proportionality coefficient would be the square root of two. Dimensional analysis is actively applied in many branches of physics, for example, in hydrodynamics. But when building the Planck system of units, we essentially did the same thing, but with quantities characterizing not a specific system, but our entire universe. In this sense, from dimensional considerations, it is logical to assume that the derived quantities may also have some fundamental significance. Take, for example, the Planck length or time, which are approximately 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 35 meters and 5.4 times 10 to the power of minus 44 seconds, respectively. Today, physicists believe that these quantities may describe the minimum distance and time intervals that have physical meaning in our universe. According to this hypothesis, space and time are divided into some kind of cells, and during movement, whether in space or time, we can only move by a whole number of such cells. This assumption plays a key role in one of the theories of quantum gravity, known as loop quantum gravity. There is also an opinion that the Planck length describes the size of our universe after the Planck time, the moment of the Big Bang. We can also create a Planck unit of energy, which will be the Planck equivalent of the familiar joule. To do this, multiply the Planck mass by the square of the speed of light, resulting in a quantity of two times 10 to the power of nine joules. By the way, this is not so much, only 500 kilowatt hours. However, if we assume that we are talking about energy characteristic of quantum processes, roughly the energy that an elementary particle can possess, then this is already quite decent. The most high energy particle we have ever recorded had energy 100 million times smaller. To accelerate a particle to such energy using our modern technologies, we would need a ring accelerator, like the Large Hadron Collider, but with a ring length of about a light year. Now, if we divide the Planck energy by the Boltzmann constant, obtaining the so-called Planck temperature, this temperature will be equal to 1.4 times 10 to the power of 32 degrees, far beyond the temperatures we have ever achieved or plan to achieve in the foreseeable future. By definition, this is the temperature at which the average kinetic energy of the thermal motion of particles in a substance will correspond to the Planck energy. Sometimes it is even said that this is the maximum temperature to which a substance can be heated. But this is not quite a correct and even completely incorrect statement. The point is a bit different. At such energy, the gravitational interaction of substance particles, determined by their energy, will become comparable in magnitude to other fundamental interactions. Therefore, we won't be able to neglect gravity as is usually done in quantum mechanics and we don't know how to take into account gravitational interaction at the quantum level yet. In simpler terms, we currently cannot describe the state of matter at such temperatures. That is, we can heat the substance more, but what will happen to it at such temperatures at this stage of development, we do not know. The Planck mass, approximately two times 10 to the power of minus eight kilograms, is close to the masses we encounter in real life, about the weight of a grain of sand, for example. However, if we again say that this is the mass of an elementary particle, then it is already a lot. It is assumed that this is the maximum mass that a quantum particle can have in principle, because more massive particles will automatically form black holes around them. Conversely, it is assumed that the Planck mass is the minimum mass of a black hole. However, can we be sure that the Planck units really have such or any other physical meaning? Unfortunately, we cannot. 
In physics, to be confident in something, it needs to be tested through experimentation. However, most Planck quantities, as we have already established, lie far beyond our experimental capabilities. How can we assert anything about a distance of 10 to the power of minus 35 meters when the current limit of our measurement capabilities is around 10 to the power of minus 18 meters? Moreover, as mentioned earlier, the method of dimensional analysis, through which we attributed physical meaning to Planck units, works with an accuracy up to a constant that can take various values. Even if space turns out to be quantized, divided into peculiar indivisible cells, and if the size of such a cell indeed turns out to be proportional to the Planck length, what will be the proportionality coefficient? The quantum of space may be equal to several Planck lengths or even several thousand of such lengths, or conversely, constitute hundredths or thousandths of the Planck length. Dimensional analysis cannot tell us. It should also be noted that not all Planck units can, in principle, be endowed with some profound physical meaning. For example, they introduce the so-called Planck resistance, which turns out to be equal to 30 ohms. I believe that anyone who has ever soldered some electrical circuits would agree that a standard 30 ohm resistor possesses no fundamental physical characteristics. So, saying that Planck units definitely have some hidden physical meaning is not accurate. Rather, they can be perceived as indicators of the scale of various physical phenomena. In simpler terms, we can indeed assume that at such scales of physical quantities, we may discover some previously unknown effects. However, we may not discover them with the same success. It would be very interesting to find out whether we will detect them or not. In this sense, Planck quantities are like mysterious beacons for physicists something to strive towards to discover what is there. By the way, the idea of tying units of measurement of physical quantities to some universal characteristics of the universe has received practical application. If you are interested in how such quantities as kilograms, meters, seconds, and the like are determined from a physical point of view today, as well as what other systems of physical quantities exist and why they are needed, write about it in the comments and we will definitely address this question in one of our next videos. Meanwhile, goodbye and until our next meeting.